stuff. So we have that pot potential, as I mentioned. It just needs to be channelized in the right direction. And wow. that's, I guess, you guys have a huge task because it's an uphill task. It will take time, but inshallah, hopefully, we should be getting there at some point in time, right? As they say, it takes a village to raise a child. Exactly. This is the village. Exactly. Yeah. So you guys, we're all in a this village together, so we need to now start promoting game development, game designing as a huge potential, career potential as well for the youngsters out there. Okay, so right now, we were mostly talking about the production side of the gaming industry. I would I like to move a little bit on the consumption side as well and talk about eSports. I know uh, you have your own views about it, but we still like to talk about it. Um, eSports is now seeing quite a bit of emergence, not only in Pakistan, but outside of Pakistan as well. Uh, it has been, for the very first time, added on as a medal-winning category in the upcoming Asian Games uh, 2022. They were supposed to happen uh, next month in September, but due to the COVID situation in China, the games have been postponed till September 2023. So now the eSports is going to be a formal official category with potentials of winning medals in the Asian um, Games, which is an um, Olympic level game, by the way, right? So now going forward, all the countries will be sending across their official uh, content, uh, you know, delegations or sportsperson to go and uh, compete in this category as well. And for that, Khawar, I would like you, because it's uh, eSports is your forte right now in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the company and the country as well. So how do you see the eSports panning out in Pakistan going forward? I know that it's been picking up. It's not just Tencent is focusing on it, but there are other companies now who have you know, new companies coming up and there are huge competitions going on. And there's a lot of money going around in that as well, which is generating quite a bit of healthy economic activity within the gamers. So if you can please comment on that. Sure. So for everyone, uh, eSports is basically the competitive gaming side. And uh, the future of eSports is very promising in Pakistan. And I say this with conviction because just last week we concluded the biggest uh, LAN event of Pakistan with PUBG Mobile uh, going through 40 plus campuses all across Pakistan at getting the raw talent to compete uh, under one roof, uh, competing for a four million prize pool, uh, along with the blessings of the Pakistan Olympics. So uh, this time in Asian Games, there are eight games that, are, that have a medal competition, and four of the games are owned by Tencent, which puts a lot of responsibility on us to work towards getting Pakistan's uh, talent to compete for the medals and eventually hopefully get a medal for Pakistan. I think the the important part here is to understand that uh, eSports is a very small subset of the overall gaming ecosystem, around a billion dollar uh, plus minus. Uh, but this billion dollar is uh, basically going to increase over the years. Uh, the youth uh, takes gaming very seriously because uh, with sports comes a lot of emotions, passions, and a lot of things. So uh, eSports allow a lot of Pakistani players to represent Pakistan globally, which brings in a lot of soft image. Uh, I think it's uh, safe to say that before Arsalan Ash, uh, in the Tekken world, Pakistan was not known at all. And now everybody talks about, you know, Pakistan, where is this country where they are producing this talent, which is getting... Uh, even in PUBG Mobile, we had a world invitation uh, contest just recently, and uh, one of the teams from Pakistan was presenting it. Uh, so our goal in eSports is first to create that grassroots level nurturing environment where players from Pakistan can compete nationally and then eventually go for international competitions. Where they can represent Pakistan. The prize pools are huge and amazing. Uh, the economy around it is supplemented by a lot of data consumption, so a lot of 5G use cases where streaming is happening, where the competition is broadcasted live, because a lot of the audience enjoys watching it. So it's sort of integrated economy where there are events happening and everything. And I think uh, we're closely working with the Pakistan Olympics Association, and our goal is that uh, we get the best talent to represent Pakistan and hopefully uh, bring in uh, a lot of good name for us. And in this process, of course, we are working with the telecom operators uh, because they have the connectivity that allows eSports uh, to work. So I'm very hopeful and I think there is a lot of talent 
in Pakistan, and it's not, not just one game. And uh, I think talking about the infrastructure, a lot of the things are missing when it comes to giving them the right uh, conditioning, the right sort of mental ability to compete at global levels. And uh, we are very excited working with the local organizations to set up that sort of environment. Well, we're really happy. Atif has called me out, so I think it's, imp it's important to offer a quick clarification. I am uh, the biggest fan of esports that you can possibly imagine. Uh, I'm going to take a minute because it's a good story as well. I was 24 years old when Arslan beat me silly in a Tekken competition. When I exited out of that competition and Arslan and I became acquaintances after that, I talked to a friend of mine and I was like, how is it that this guy is weaker to me, who was actually still playing the game at that point, who's the, who's the, who just won the tournament, right? And, I, and my friend was like, I don't think somebody can get much better than Arsalan. And it took us 10 years before Arsalan got the visa, got the chance to compete at an international competition, and effectively become the world champion, right? He's the only human being ever to have won both the Japanese na championship and the American championship, both the Evos. So th I'm a huge fan. I, and, and, I think it's a, and I think there's a huge uh, shout out that needs to be had. Come on, guys, let's have some applause, right? So my, my concern comes from the fact that I think it is more the eminent domain of the Ministry of Sports. He is a, these are true sporting heroes, whether it's uh, uh, Arslan or Khan, now his protege, or Sumail, who now plays for Evil Geniuses. Like, these players need to be recognized and become household names like Babar Azam, because they are superstars. How big superstars are they? If I were to ask you that which is the sporting tournament, and this is my final question, right? Which sporting tournament has the largest prize money in the world? You know, everybody gravitates towards golf, tennis, football, even American football. The truth is that the largest sporting tournament in the world is 10x the World Cup prizes for all of these sports. And it is basically a Dota 2 tournament called the International, which is held by Valve, which is neck and neck with the League of Legends leagues. And this is something important to understand. We want our kids to understand playing on a team, uh, you know, and how to lead a team, how to organize ourselves, because community is important, right? Teaching people how to play well together. Games is the number one avenue, and I heavily encourage children to play competitive sports as a foundation to how to play with the team. Uh, I'd just like to add something. So one of the challenges we face uh, during the process is that parents are often reluctant um, and they're even questioning the management calling us, is it true, uh, you know, they're getting half a million, million rupees worth of prize pool, is it a scam? So uh, again, I think uh, on that level, uh, parents are a very important stakeholder in gaming, uh, teachers and parents together. So the idea of going to the campuses and rewarding people in front of teachers and parents is sort of giving them this uh, feeler that this is a promising career. And I think uh, he mentioned Babar Azam. Yes, uh, parents' support is a pivotal factor here. Uh, we just also had the PUBG Mobile World event. The prize pool was $15 million. So imagine uh, you know, a bunch of uh, four, uh, squad, we, call, we call it SWAT. So four players winning huge prize pool. It's, it's sort of, you know, uh, life-changing transformation for these guys. So I think parents um, in, in all, uh, all of the gaming, including the dev side, uh, parents and teachers are very important stakeholders as well. I, I think, uh, Khabar, you've made a very valid point that these are the two um, stakeholders who have a lot of skepticism and disbelief around this area. And it needs to be addressed in the right manner because, of course, uh, there's a healthy way of doing gaming as well. And they need to be educated, the parents and the teachers, and even the children need to be educated as well on how to get, you know, get the healthy gameplay into their overall routine on a daily basis or a weekly basis or whatever. But I'm happy to see that, um, I'm happy to hear, and I knew about this, that we've got some really great esports heroes who are representing Pakistan internationally. And again, as we said, we need as much success stories, as many positive stories out there as possible. These are our brand ambassadors, and we should, you know, promote them as much as possible. So now moving on to you, Kaya. <clears throat>
Gaming is not just about science and economics only, right? There's an art and science to gaming. And there's a, a, as somebody mentioned, I think it was Bilal, that there's an animation part to it as well. So we've seen it in other countries, and Korea is a great example as well, that because as you know, you need to understand the magnitude of gaming worldwide. There are millions of people who are at the single point in time on gaming platforms. So that's a captive audience, right? So a lot of countries, what they're trying to do now is they're trying to promote their own culture and their own art scene, their own museum, their own architecture through the gaming environment. And I'll give you a very recent example. <coughs> there's a, I don't, know if, uh, I don't see a lot of youngsters. I'm not sure if all of you would know, but there's a very famous uh, uh, K-pop band, a girl K-pop band called Blackpink in Korea. And they recently uh, released their latest music. I don't know if it was a complete album or a song. They recently released their latest music album in PUBG in gaming environment. So they did it virtually inside the game in the PUBG game environment. And they had more than 15 million views just on that PUBG gaming environment. So that's how they're now promoting their culture and their art, and they're getting their own stories out to the larger audience. So Kaya, I would like to, you know, because Pakistan has a lot of great stories, and we have a lot of, we have a very thriving and exciting arts and culture scenes as well. And we've, we've got a nation with a good history, background, and every, but we're just unable to get those stories out in the right mediums. And now the technology is moving away from the traditional stuff, right? It's not just television and all that, it's social media, it's gaming environments, it's, you know, all the other metaverse and all the things that are coming up in the future as well. So how, in your opinion, can Pakistan um, get its stories across in the gaming environment? Because as I said, it's not just the science and economics of gaming. We need to get the art and culture piece in it as well. Um, so just to give you an example, um, I have worked with companies globally and um, you know, on a local scale as well. I've launched about, helped launch about four games uh, globally, AAA, indie, and mobile. Um, and I've done it from my living room. And I think that's really cool. That's a really cool part of the gaming industry that I found it's, it's more easily accessible for, for a single developer than you know, maybe movies and comic books or television has been. When I've worked in comics, people have often asked me, oh, can you travel? And I'm like, no, I cannot. I don't have the, you know, the fees or the, uh, you know, the way, you know, the necessities to travel. So they say, you know, well, we can't work with you. But with gaming, they've been more accepting. They've been more, you know, fluid in their work environment. And I think that's a very cool thing. Um, right now, I'm working with Sumo, um, which is a AAA company in England, and which has been acquired by Tencent, by the way. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting here in, in my living room and working with them. You know, so that's one thing I wanted to touch upon as an individual sitting here amongst the sea level uh, people. That as an individual, it's been very you know eye opening for me as a game developer. Um, another thing that I want to say is having worked in movies, TV, comic, comics, and now in games is that it's a very different medium, games. Um, you know, when you're watching a movie or reading a book or, you know, watching TV, you're watching somebody else. But in games, you are the hero. You're making the decisions. You are the hero of your story, right? What you say or do has an impact. So you're basically the driving force, which is why stories and games have a higher impact emotionally than a t TV show or a movie would have. I have myself have spent you know countless hours crying after playing a video game because it's just impacted me so emotionally. Especially you know the narrative if it's very rich, I get you know very very moved by it. So you know, th and I'm not the only one because there are so many games that have resonated with people that have you know just been such a positive impact for them. Why is it then that we don't have our characters? You know, shine bright in you know in, in these mediums. Why is it that when you think Pakistan or Pakistani characters, you think about these very negative, um, violent? I'm not going to go into the hyper terrorism, but you know it's true. That's what everybody's thinking right now. When you think Pakistan, when you th you think uh, brown filter, brown movie filter, right? <laughs> That's all you think. You think um, Arabic, in a very negative way, and it's sad. Um, you know, for the longest time. That's been the case. So my goal as an individual has been to kind of change that narrative. And I did semi-successfully, I like to think successfully, with Destruction All-Stars, which was a game where it had 
a Pashto and Urdu speaking character for the first time for a PS5 title, right? <laughs> and he wasn't a negative character, he wasn't a villain, he was one of the main roster characters that you could choose from. His name was Sergeant Rescue. He was a father from Pakistan in Peshawar who had immigrated to Canada. So he had these very fun dad jokes that he used to crack. And he's one of the most popular characters in that uh, game right now. He's become the poster child for Destruction All-Stars. Same with this other character. Her name is Twinkle Riot. She's this cute little anime girl with like these cat helm this cat helmet and she communicates through emojis. She's actually a Dubai you know, based cosplayer, so, you know, she became the poster child as well, she, you know, she's speaking Arabic in the game, she's speaking it positively, and I had people reach out to me from, you know, far-flung areas saying, well, we relate so much, to this. it was so nice to see Urdu being spoken in a positive way. So, when I, whenever I sit down to write a story, or when I tell people to write stories, I say, please, 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 put yourself in the stories, because it will resonate with others. Your culture will resonate because the thing is Pakistan has such a rich culture. No one area is the same. Take Punjab, Sindh, KP, Balochistan, I mean, there's, we're so diverse, GB, and each area has its own story. You know, it has its own folklore, it has its own mysticism, it has its own language, it's music. So there isn't just like one thing that we can borrow, we can borrow so many things. And the more we borrow, the more we highlight, I feel like, you know, that's our, that's our way to show and share with the world. And I think we should definitely do that. We should, we as, you know, as individuals are a bit apprehensive. We had this diaspora with, you know, showing ourselves to the world. We are a bit afraid. And I, I understand that because, you know, it is, it is a bit, you know, scary to share yourself with the world, but I feel like we should. I think the time has come where we should, you know, change the narrative of how we're perceived abroad. Even if it's on an individual scale, do it. You know, 30, 30, just a little bit of stuff. Just bring a little bit of stuff to your, to your games and just watch it shine, watch it resonate with everybody. Miss Marvel was so well received by people because they heard Pakistani music and they saw Karachi. They saw the, you know, those little things where the mom and the, uh, you know, the daughter are arguing and they're like, oh, we used to argue with that, like that. It's the small things. And we, again, our culture is so rich. We can find things that can relate to a wider audience. So yes. <laughs> Just to add to it, I don't know how many of you have played Call of Duty, but I know some of our friends. If you, s if you recall, and if you're playing a map, and you pull out Peshawar or Karachi, which <laughs> Peshawar We've never seen that Peshawar. We don't know how, how someone conceived those roads and those signs and those barber shops, and there's chaos and destruction and roads are uprooted. We don't recognize those things that you somewhere decided is Peshawar or Karachi, and we globally uh, are portraying that. So I think it's very high time with the advancement in creating world environments with very, very good photorealism, we can showcase the real, beautiful, positive side of Pakistan, our culture, rich history to the world. And in that aspect, there are a few games that are coming up. I don't know if I'm at the liberty to say those names, those guys might be watching, but they have created these beautiful maps of Leari and Sialkot and Lahore, and their characters are very, very hyper-local, often inspired by memes, and, and they're coming up soon. I really look forward to more of this happening. So I can absolutely relate to it. Uh. I'd also like to, that now that the panel is almost over, I'm throwing a sugar may degenerate. Uh, I'd like to add that this Call of Duty reference is what I had in my mind as well. I mean, in, in a Call of Duty game, this is one of the top selling game franchises in the world. Their alt reality was so high <laughs> that Pakistan had become the local hegemon in this entire area and America was the underdog fighting us. <laughs> so you just imagine the, the disconnect in which we were the superpower. I mean, I'd love for that vision to be true, uh, but like that's how far the disconnect extended. Gigi, please, Howard. So I'd like to just add that uh, pu as publishers, this is our responsibility and part of our strategy that localization is the key. I think when you talk about penetrating with a AAA sort of a game, uh, you cannot do it without localization. And with this, this strategy, there's one problem that there are not many uh, IPs in Pakistan if you want to really take them uh, to global. So as PUBG Mobile, we started with two things. Uh, we spoke to Jio, and Jio has a character, Donkey Raja, uh, Foxy. And uh, so we 
we are now integrating that character into the game and hopefully this is going to go global. Um, other than this, we believe that truck art it has a very significant uh, recall globally. So what we've done is we, we worked with some artists in Pakistan and we took the truck art and made backpacks, weapons, uh, parachutes and these things and they are now uh, part of our ecosystem. So I think localization uh, is a responsibility on big publishers. Uh, unfortunately, small gaming studios, they have to create content for some other markets where they can monetize and in that case, they don't have the liberty. But as big publishers, I think this is part of the core strategies and when they come, they would be looking for artists, IPs and all of those elements that they can do. And that's where I think the animation studio could also work on creating those IPs, uh, which are really uh, scarce in Pakistan. Khabar, you also did a campaign on PUBG around different monuments in the, as well, some yeah. of the so visuals I that think, uh, Within the game, you can incorporate a lot of the, you know, architectures and buildings. Uh, we did one campaign with Pakistan Tourism Development, and that was part of our uh, B2G relationship where the government wanted to promote tourism. So what we did, we actually worked on creating an environment within the game where people had to go through all the different landscapes and landmarks in Pakistan. And that sort of thing basically highlight, so the potential is there. I think we can work with museums, we can have a lot of uh, other architectural building where the youth has never been because of, you know, uh, expense of traveling and stuff. So those immersive experience, of course, uh, are, the are the future. And uh, our goal is, of course, that you incorporate localization into it. So since we're discussing this, and this is a bit of a conflict of interest for me, but I, I'm a Pakistani, right? Uh, I studied abroad, I had the option of staying. I said, Kenai, if every generation leaves, then how is this country going to become a huge success story? So with so much talk about culture, uh, I'd like to offer this small addendum. Okay, yes, I think there are many companies now looking at telling those great stories for Pakistan. And um, I'm honored to be one of them. We're actually currently putting together a game which is based on the longest serving Indian empire that has ever existed, also known as the Mughal dynasty. Uh, and we're telling a very holistic and inclusive story of how all the cultures uh, gained so much with the tenure spent there. So I think you'll see that in these next 10 years, you will get increasingly ambitious people telling Pakistani stories to the world, much like I'm sure everybody remembers that tune, right? The moment it plays, Ertugulki. So I'm hoping that more and more cultural uh, uh, exports will become a thing for the Pakistan games and animation industry. That's it. Yeah, it's really heartening to know the kind of work happening in the private sector. Uh, Ministry of IT can also promote collaboration um, through Pasha and uh, you know Tencent and other players of the industry with the Ministry of Information um, and with the we can take on board provincial culture departments as well uh, and media houses needs to be engaged so maybe uh, for the gaming industry we should plan at least one event within Pakistan also uh, where all uh, so this uh, Lollywood uh, 2.0 can really happen. <laughs> no, I, I think if, yeah, I, I think one of the key takeaways from all of this discussion is that, I don't know, for whatever reason, we're very shy about telling our stories to the rest of the world. We need to be more confident about it. We need to come out of that, you know, a little shy or a little hesitant mindset that we have as a nation. Yes, we do have challenges in the country, but believe you me, every country has challenges. There's no country on this world which is not facing any kind of challenge. So, of course, the challenges are unique to each country, but we need to overcome that mindset and just start putting ourselves out there much more confidently. On that note, I'm going to also open up the floor. Uh, uh, I'm going to open up the floor for the Q&A session with the audience. And I also believe that, um, I don't know who's doing the live streaming, if we have any questions virtually as well, I'll be happy to take a couple. We do have some time. So is there anybody from the audience who'd like to comment, feedback? Yes, we've got a hand raised at the back. Can somebody please give a mic to the gentleman?
Sir, before asking your question, I would request you to please give us your name and if you're representing a company as well, thank, that would be great. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Hassan. I'm a professor at Fast University. I was actually curious about uh, this point that has been highlighted by uh, Ali Saab and also resonated by other panel members about the lack of training and expertise uh, that is being felt. Okay, our uh, developers and even our faculty lack certain trainings in this. So I was just curious if there were any plans in motion or if you guys had any uh, sort of even broad strokes about what kind of uh, role academia can play in this and because I belong to academia and uh, as a top city uh, in computer science we would be more than happy to play a positive and helpful role in this. So I was just curious if you guys have any plans for us that we can you know uh, talk about later on. Okay. So, so first you want to start and then Ali you want to go? Yeah. So I'll quickly share what we did as part of this AGG initiative. AGG, Animation, Graphics and Gaming, is a subsector of this tech industry. We made a committee and we decided what are the key interventions we need to undertake to immediately address the pressing is issues. And this supply of talented and skilled people was the first mode, uh, foremost. And so as Epic, what we did, we created a module with Fast Islamabad campus and we took some senior artists out, designed a course, and taught that as an elective over there. And we asked their faculty and their uh, RAs to uh, go through it, to shadow it with the train the trainer strategy. And we saw that there was a quite an uptake. For us, as a company, to spare a full-time senior resource to do this for three months was not sustainable. So we said, okay, let's now run this with a few other universities, perhaps not with the hard engineering background, Let's do it with the PNCA or otherwise art schools and see if this module works. And then we can support it by helping you develop your lab, by giving you licenses and otherwise support. And those master trainers can take it forward. That's one thing. On the other side, there were several initiatives that uh, CEC member Pasha as the AGG committee had overtook. And I think he can shed more light on that. One of the key things that I would mention was to send faculty members from Pakistan to the University of Bournemouth, UK. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much can I <laughs> share. I will, uh, so yeah, it's in the works. Thank you. Uh, great question, Ji. And I think uh, this is a, a conversation that comes up. I'm quite the quant. Uh, I, I work on data. Um, one data point that is important is that we often say that the academia is not producing output. Let me say that sometimes this uh, statement gets con con contorted to imply that the Pakistani academia is not producing uh, output. I think global academia actually suffers from this problem. And that what's necessary is to think outside the box. They can, we can follow what the, whatever standards are being set internationally uh, ad nauseum and still fail. Or we can realize that perhaps some of the smaller countries, take Ukraine as an example, they're they are doing these deep collaborations with the industry. Um, and uh, because of that, Eastern Europe has emerged as a hub for many different kinds of technology because each uh, of them is editing their curriculum to match industry needs proactively. Now, talking about what's actually happening, uh, I had a brief uh, participation with the uh, academic curriculum, uh, thanks to Dr. Shweb, who's also a CEC member with uh, Pasha, but also sits on the HEC panel. So what we got managed to get do, uh, do is that we submitted a eight course curriculum for gaming and animation specializations into uh, to the HEC for approval. Once approved, those courses can provide a foundation for third and fourth year graduates to become very specialized towards this field. And I think this is what's required across the board. We need to do a hard bridge at year three and four to do very uh, industry specific courses, uh, especially in lab work, uh, lots more lab work, lots of focus. So that this is one thing that I think is in the pipeline and once this gets approved, then those courses can be taught in universities. But of course, we understand how this works. Only if the universities choose to teach them. The kids would love to study it, but you need to. And I would like to do a special call out to Air University. Uh, I think they've done some phenomenal work in leading from the front via actually teaching game design bachelors, game development bachelors from the get-go. It's the first university to do in Pakistan, so I think some credit is definitely deserved. 
Bilal, you want to add? It's not accredited. It's still not accredited. They still pushed for it. So the credit asked to go was they did. They took a bold step that even while it's not accredited and everything else is in the works, they still pushed for it and taught it. And their first batch will come out in next summer. Yeah, Bilal, and and just uh, one more thing. Currently, you have, must have seen that you know in collaboration with Parsha. Um, PSCB is actually running different programs, capacity building programs. But on top of that, um, you know, Ignite has also been mandated for the same task, the, uh, to have uh, the c capacity building exercises. So we are coming up with a program around 10,000 uh, individuals will be trained, and gaming is one part of it. Other than that, I just talked about the gaming and animation and training is one key element of that uh, center of excellence as well. So these are three programs which are again focusing on capacity building and eventually students and teachers both will be trained equally. Ji sir, you, you've got your hand first. Uh, the gentleman with the mask, half mask. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Ahmed Shmim Pirzada, Director General PTA. Uh, I have a few comment that one is that the conventional education, now there is a, you know, separation between the conventional education system or certifications because the parents, this is a big issue for the parents that if someone, some child want to go to the these kind of different kinds of like this gaming business or this uh, meta world. So there is a need for, if we go for the conventional education system, then they, there's, it is very difficult to go to take both the uh, things together. Second is uh, there is a big uh, health issue for the parents that the children spend a lot of time uh, on these gaming, uh, you know, uh, stuff, and uh, day and nights are vice versa. So they they have the nights have been changed to days, and days had been changed to the night. So we have to, you know, that another thing is the certifications. There's a confusion with the chair uh, parents that they should go both for some international certification instead of conventional education because now the specific capabilities are required for everything for every kind of technology. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take first crack at this, but I'll be very, very brief. So um, first things, gaming as a health issue is overstated. Um, honestly speaking, it is uh, embarrassing for uh, mental health to say, that somebody played games for 16 hours and then did something to themselves, L where is the parental responsibility? Today, parents are not spending enough time in contact with their child. They're not making sure that ev everything is good in moderation. In short, everything, even academics, is only good in moderation. And this is something that I feel it is very easy to pass the buck to any exercise. Our parents said that the child always cricket hi khelta rata hai. I mean, it's not cricket's fault, right? It's a physical activity. It's good for them. It's helping them socialize. So this big sweeping statement, may I feel that there is a lot of responsibility on the gaming industry to provide the positive research to show that this is not a problem. And like everything, it has pros and cons associated with it. The other question that you said about the education and, and, and parents wanting to go for, for, for newer things, is that I have two comments. First one is that across the board, as he mentioned, PSEB is doing boot camps, academia interventions, and all of those, in my humble opinion, are the right answer. I believe university has a space. But up, you look at all of the uh, interview criteria from FANG, which is the acronym for the five top uh, uh, global IT companies, and they've all said that we would have equal preference for a university grad or anybody who has passed these certified courses. It is a mindset change. As a nation, we shouldn't always be the latest adopter for every trend. Our advantage is that we have nothing to lose by playing it risky. I mean, after all, we are losing everything anyways. We have to play it aggressive to win the initiative back. My final comment, this is a little undeserved, but this is a good forum for it. The gentleman said something very meaningful uh, when he said that, you know, Pakistan could be a great hub, large English-speaking population, large tech base. Can we please try and understand that Whatever colonialism has gifted us with, unfortunately, aside, 
the fact that we have a large English speaking uh, population is one of the few things that allows us to be very globally competitive. You take this away, as certain recent national level curriculum programs have tried to do, and the aftermath will be very, very damaging. Right? We are who we are, how we choose to serve the nation. The language is an asset right now. Let's not try to sabotage that asset. This is just a thought point for everybody. Okay, ji. Um, any other question? Ji, gentlemen, sir. Uh, my name is Dr. Muhammad Saleem. I'm former DGPTA and member competition commission of Pakistan. I have few, uh, first of all, I congratulate Pasha to have such th type of discussions over here, which is very really the need of the day. And as we are facing very economic challenges in the country, I think this is the area which we need to concentrate and put all our efforts to promote this, uh, this subject all over the country. But I have few uh, observations regarding, there are, I have the opportunity to teach different universities in the city, and I have experienced that. There's a lot of issues with the students and they don't know even after graduating from the university where they should go. So I generally ask the students, don't go after the job, but you should create an environment where you should generate the employment. As we know, there are 21,000 graduating IT sector in uh, one in a year around the uh, all, all over the country, but we need to think about that. Are we doing something for them? The question is the only 10% of the, those are getting the job. 90% are just moving around. I have suggestion that there are three areas which need to be concentrate. One is we have already discussed, that is the curriculum. We need to redesign the curriculum, specialize design, well-designed course for the gaming. We need to train the faculty they should know how to teach that one. And the more important thing, the 21,000 students, we need to make an arrangement that should be an interaction with those students and with the collaboration with the industry. At least one or two, two days workshop should be held in big cities. Call all these 21,000 students, make them educate and tell them what are the avenues where they should go and work on that. The second, which is very important thing, is that our faculty is not well trained. I have also so have seen the opportunity. The university, even they graduate, and the highly skilled IT degrees they are awarding that, they don't have the computer labs. And when I have the interface with them, they have only gone through the theories, but they don't have hand-on experience. Okay. So these are the areas which need to be focused on it and I think we can actually reap those benefits if we have a very good awareness campaign, we have the interaction, interaction with the students and tell them where they sh should go. Okay. Thank you. So you have a comment that you want to add on to this one? Yes, Junaid Imam. I think very pertinent concern, but this concern does not only relate to the gaming industry, it's related to the overall IT sector. And I think uh, as Pakistan has seen uh, exponential growth in our IT exports, uh, we saw challenges of supply side. And uh, we sat down with the industry, and the key problem identified was the gap between the industry and the academia. So uh, through PSAB, we initiated multiple programs boot camps, industry academia, bridge, where industry professionals are going to the academia. Uh, they are working with the uh, in, uh, academia professor uh, to train the students in the seventh and eighth semester. Besides this, we have also launched a program where industry professional is actually uh, having a boot camp for the uh, professors as well, for the teachers as well. So uh, 
we industry and government realize that uh, unless we bridge this gap between industry and academia, we will continue to face this problem. So uh, we all realize this, but I think uh, one key issue is the capacity. Even the government and the industry, we are limited in capacity as far as uh, execution of uh, this program across Pakistan is concerned. We have uh, been talking with HEC, so they have a fundamental role to play. If we have to make this 26,000 ICT graduate coming out of our universities every year, if we want to make them uh, employable, so university, HEC, government, industry, we all have to work together. It's just the start that we have made, but I think we all have to collaborate to make it a success. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a massive effort that needs to be done. I am loving the enthusiasm in the audience and a lot of hands coming up, but I am just going to take two more questions because we are short on time. And there's this lady at the back. She's been, she's been you know, raising her hand for quite some time, so I'm going to hand the mic over to her first. And then, and then in the meanwhile, can the Facebook or the social media team let me know if there's any questions virtually? Do we, uh, Hera, do we have any questions virtually from our virtual audience? Um, hi, Atfa. So I'm Sophia. I work at Mindstorm Studios. I'm a researcher by profession. Uh, before coming to Mindstorm Studios, I was working in the development sector as an education um, researcher. So. Um, Coming to some of the questions, I think Dr. Rizwan, if I'm from FAST, Agamapka Hassan, sorry, so raised as well, is that something that we noticed, uh, noticed in our program as well. We've been running a program for students and this year for teachers, in which teachers join and they learn game building, all aspects of game building, and students join. And this year we had about 2,300 students join online, and it's for free. Uh, the reason for it being free again, going to what we're talking about right now, is that inclusivity is at the heart of game building. It is the heart of creativity, it is the heart of what we do, and you know, like the bigger challenge in terms of more than teaching it at university, and more than teaching things that have already come, you know, into um, play in game building currently, is channeling students Ed, you know, education and interest and their desire to learn. Because at the end of the day, if we teach them what is there in the current curriculum today, by the time they graduate, everything that they have learned will become antiquated. So the real skill is to teach them self-confidence, is, te is to help teachers empathize with the students so that we create uh, an environment that's cohesive and conducive to growth, development, and empowerment. I think uh, in line with that, like, fortunately, we have had the, um, you know, it's been amazing to partner with Pasha to conduct the research. And I would love to, you know, talk about everyone a little bit more on this. But yeah, it's honestly a great panel. And thank you so much for inviting us and setting it up. Thank and you. Some really yeah. great thoughts coming from you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to take the last question from our guest uh, from Taiwan, uh, Dr. Fan? Fan, yeah. And I'm so sorry, I know there are a lot of questions that a lot of other audience members have. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, we're, so we're going to, be, um, you know, we're going to have a lunch plus networking session. So all the panelists are going to be available offline so you can have a one-on-one -on -one discussions with them as well. But again, as I said, I'm loving the positive energy. And sir, over to you for your question, please. Uh, in fact, I don't have a question. I just have uh, some comments to share. Uh, some, some of the experience that we have. Uh, maybe uh, it is relevant or it's uh, not relevant here. Okay, uh, for example, talking about the uh, industrial and academic uh, uh, interchange, uh, this gentleman talked about uh, accreditation, right? But uh, this is going to be very difficult. The way we handle it in Taiwan, okay, uh, uh, there are two uh, general ways. One is uh, some of the universities that have uh, computer-related departments, and also they have uh, arts-related departments. So, so they have enough faculty, so they join, uh, they uh, cooperate and uh, created some uh, uh, interdisciplinary programs. Okay, so for example, if I'm from the computer department, when I graduate, I still uh, uh, graduate with a computer degree, however, there are two ways. One is on the certificates as a stamp, a special 
the program in blah blah blah, you know. Or an alternate an alternative is uh, to have another piece of paper that says this guy went through this program. So instead of uh, going through that lengthy and very difficult way of accreditation, this is the way out. Okay, and uh, a lot of times this is happens to be interdisciplinary. No one existing uh, academic discipline can handle gaming. Okay, it has to be interdisciplinary. Okay, and another way is uh, in Taiwan, the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs, uh, what they do is uh, they uh, allocated a budget so that uh, uh, they, en uh, they encourage the businesses, you know, uh, to take in some graduates. For example, uh, uh, one, uh, one, one company that I handled, okay, uh, I, I was uh, uh, review reviewing all the uh, applica application from the companies. What they do is, uh, uh, for example, if the company takes in five graduates from other disciplines, okay, then they will retrain them on the job, okay. For example, one uh, big gaming uh, company in Taiwan, in Kaohsiung, they took in, I think, six or seven. They put three in a 2D animation and four in a 3D animation. You know, so what, what the government do is they provide subsidies so that the graduates, they get some very basic pay, okay? And the company that take in the graduates, they also get in some uh, subsidy for that. That's not enough to make money, now, you know. So it is a, a cooperation so that the graduate who gets in for six months, okay, they have uh, some basic uh, income to, to sustain, okay. And the company, uh, because when you train five, peop five students, okay, you have to throw in the resources, okay. So they are subsidized on that. And uh, in the past three years, uh, we have, uh, you know, maybe subsidized uh, maybe two to 3,000 graduates. And this year, we have uh, one gaming. Okay, this is uh, the, the company, it's a gaming company that uh, takes in seven. So 2D and 3D, two different groups. Uh, so this is uh, some, something that happened in Taiwan. That in, in that case, uh, we you do not need to uh, change the original structure. Okay, then things can be done. I'm not sure whether this is relevant here. Okay. No, no, sir, I think it's very relevant. It's good to have all these international insights and to see what, how the other countries have overcome this obstacle. And I'm going to bother now. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned the Badar, okay, the other day when I came in. Uh, last Saturday, it, today is a Tuesday, so it must be uh, four days ago, uh, uh, there is one new ministry in Taiwan that is, uh, we, we, we set up. They start operation, operations on Saturday. Okay, so uh, this is into its fourth day. Uh, it, uh, in the past, uh, all the uh, IT related things are scattered all over different ministries. Okay, education and uh, you know economy affairs and things like that. They set up a new ministry uh, called Ministry of Digital Affairs. They, that uh, will uh, take in all the uh, affairs that have something to do with ICT, similar to what uh, uh, your IT and communications. But in te telecommunications. In Taiwan, it's, it is under Ministry of Transportation. Okay, so this ministry, uh, this ministry, they have two major arms apart from other other things. So one is uh, uh, information security. Okay, one is uh, uh, IT industry development. Okay, in the past, that is uh, in the Ministry of uh, Economy Affairs. Okay, and uh, things like that. And they they have other uh, other thing like. Uh, uh, the meta world, uh, things like that, you know, the very, very various different uh, uh, special units to do different things. That, that, that's what happened. 
uh, Ministry of Digital Affairs. They call it MODA. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, since we're short on time, I uh, want to wrap... If, if you just allow me to add to what Professor sir, was saying... 30 seconds. Just once, 10 seconds. Yes. Uh, Tur Turkey has appointed Dr. Ali Kahan, who happens to be their one of key ministers, uh, previous key minister's son. Dr. Ali Kahan is now the uh, advisor on digital transformation to President Ordogan. Thank you. Okay. Great, great. So um, before I wrap it up, you need to make some sort of an announcement? Yes, quick one. Uh, just taking advantage of that, we are all gathered here from the same industry and those who are watching online. Epic Games will be holding its first Unreal Engine Pakistan Game Summit. It, we've never done this as Epic in Pakistan. It's just our first time. At the end of September, we'll announce the date soon. But all of you had lots of questions around skills, around trainings, around working with uh, studios. A, few, a, a very good friend of mine, I see him in the audience. Uh, he was very instrumental in sharing the problems of the industry. And we thought, why not we do a focused uh, webinar uh, for Pakistan. So stay tuned on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Fasi. And I'll charge you for some promotion, <laughs> promotion stuff as well. Okay, so, End time. <laughs> so great conversation. I love the, uh, the conversations that we had with the panelists. I love the energy that came in from the audience as well. And uh, it, had we not been short on time, I would have, uh, you know, given more time to the Q&As because there were a lot of hands that were raised. These panelists, they're going to be here during the lunch hour, uh, during the lunch session as well. So please feel free to uh, reach out to them. And just as a concluding, I would like to say that gaming industry in Pakistan is a hidden gem. Um, it's great to see that the government and, uh, you know, is putting a lot of focus into it and now it's coming into the limelight as well. And hopefully I'm very, very confident with the conversation that we've had so far that inshallah ta'ala, the gaming industry, if it's moved in the right direction, if, it's, if the resources are channelized in the right manner, it should be a key contributor to the economic growth of Pakistan which we all need at this moment. So thank you everyone for joining and listening into this panel session. I'm going to hand it over to Hira now, who's going to take us to the next and the last part now. Round of applause for the, um, you know, such a interactive panel, I would say. Um, we, we, we move to the last part. We are honored to have our chief guest for the event, Federal Secretary uh, Mr. Mohsen Mushtaq. Uh, he has over three decades of experience working with government as well as with the development sector. But uh, the more important element that we would like to highlight is the way since the day he took charge, he has been working very closely with Pasha, with industry, to understand industry's needs and requirements and advance the agenda for IT industry growth. Uh, you know, give a huge round of applause to Mr. Mosim. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. And uh, after this panel discussion, all I say is, uh, I wish I had come a little earlier. It was a very, engaging panel discussion and after that I decided to keep my uh, written co comments aside and talk about a few things. First of all, um, Badar Khushnoor, thank you very much for uh, taking this initiative and 10 cents and for holding this event. Badar told me that uh, Mr. Fassi of Epic was here and they have acquired a company and they are setting up a gaming uh, unit in Pakistan. It's an interesting thing. Some six, seven years back, I knew a young boy, his name was Zubair Bozai. And uh, he did uh, masters from University of Urbana-Champaign. And he joined Google and then he joined a startup of a gaming company and I said, what are you doing? So like a, for leaving a big company and going for a startup gaming company, what are you do, going to do that? And he said, uncle, you don't understand. It's a very big industry and it's growing and he did wonders. So when I was just looking, uh, I was uh, going through the papers and hearing your uh, conversation, 
it reminded me of him in Silicon Valley. Okay, first part. One of the things, uh, one of the panelists was saying that there's a complaint that uh, academia is not playing its role. It is absolutely correct. I am referring to one quote which says that 70% of the World Bank research papers are never cited. And more interesting is 25% of the World Bank research is not even downloaded once. So people are doing research just for the sake of research and then they publish something and it's shared. But what is important is whether it is relevant to the society and the economy or not. Right? I, my favorite research paper was on corruption and it, I studied in development economics and the interesting thing is the paper was published in 1985, right? And the topic is market for public office, market, where you buy and sell. Public office means we understand postings and transfers. So market for public office, why Indian state is not better at development. And that paper is still, was published in 85, it is still not freely downloadable and you have to spend $10 to download it. So the research has to be, if it is meaningful, if it is relevant, it will be useful, otherwise it will be just like World Bank research. That is the second point. Third, uh, Aisha said, our addition secretary, that the industry is, uh, would like, love to do matchmaking, hand holding, definitely we are here. This is in our own personal interest also because we have been given a huge target of $5 billion of exports and uh, Badr, our ex exports of gaming this year was 50. If you can't do it 100, the no, no ministry person will attend your event anymore. So as simple as that. So either you do it or you don't. You decide it. Uh, when I heard this panel discussion, I saw honestly a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. I hope that uh, these brains, so in, uh, intelligent people, so they will play their role in increasing exports. I like the idea of whether that the Lollywood can be, if it can be converted into a gaming industry where the experiments can be done. Where we were, you see, this is, we have to understand. We were considering setting up of gaming and animation center in Karachi, in Karachi University. And they said, uh, do it in Sheikh, Sheikh Zayed Islamic Center. Now, regardless of whether we get permission or not, in Sheikh Zayed Islamic Center to th think about gaming, they would say, oh my God, this is gambling, this is jua. What are you talking about? What are you going to teach to our children? So obviously it won't be a perfect match. On the contrary, IBA and NED University have come forward and said, okay, please bring it here and we will not only set up, but we will provide manpower and students and everything, etc. So uh, we are working on it and whether we will take you on board on that. Lastly about the academia bridge, you see, uh, it's very simple. Pakistan Software Export Board is working on the uh, academia industry bridge in which in seventh and eighth semester students are being provided the industry savvy courses or the, the, something which can make them acceptable to the industry. So if you want to do it, uh, you can include gaming. I am surprised when you said that one university, Air University, they, they were saying, somebody was saying that they have established, uh, they are awarding a degree on gaming. Amazing. This is the, this is actually the, I would not say supply side intervention, there's probably the demand side intervention that there's a demand, latent demand, but you are working on it. So. I think it's a very good idea and uh, we should, we have lost our MD, PAP, SAB, he just left. So we are trying our level best to get a P, uh, 
uh, CEO of PSAB as quickly as possible at a better package, at a better package. So uh, I would expect, Junaid, uh, we are going to give you charge for tempor temporarily. So please explore this idea, all right? So I think this is good enough. Uh, thank you very much and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you, Secretary Saab. We have always been saying that the way in the past two years, a um, couple of years, Ministry of IT, Pasha and PSEB have been working together. It's like a dream team. Um, but more importantly, as we have concluded this event today, um, the way we see it is as just the beginning of the journey. A uh, journey towards unleashing the potential for gaming industry in Pakistan. And we look forward for your support and for you to join us in this journey. Thank you and have a great lunch again.